This is where we look at the theme more in depth. You sort of guessed what the theme for this week is, but this is where we look at it a bit more in depth. Um, you won't be surprised to know that a very common experience these days, especially during lockdown, is the experience of being alone. And you won't be surprised to hear that a very common fear is a fear of loneliness, a fear of being forgotten, a fear of being unloved, a fear of being uncared for. And it's a fear that doesn't just affect older people. I, a couple of weeks ago, I said how research had shown that at least 25%, a quarter of young people surveyed said that they struggled with loneliness, loneliness and isolation. Um, and this is even before lockdown. It's just been made worse by lockdown. And this is despite social media, which often actually makes things worse. At one of our growing young webinars, okay, that's the last time I'm using that word today, okay? But one of our growing young webinars, oh, I just used it again, never mind. Um, someone called Brad Griffin said something that I found really quite surprising and refreshing. This is what he said. He'd asked a young person what they loved about their church the most, and their answer was not the exciting programs for young people or the, the, the style of worship or the modern music or anything like that. Their answer was, it feels like family. It feels like family. Isn't that a wonderful thing for someone to say of any age? It feels like family. And it made me think, I wonder what the first church felt like. I wonder what the early Christians felt like when they thought of church. So we're going to find a description of them in this morning's reading. Uh, Helen's going to read it for us. And uh, it's going to be from Acts chapter 2, reading from verse 42 to verse 47. As they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Amen. Thank you, Helen. It's lovely to have you in church again. <laughs> so hearing these words, what image comes to your mind? I mean, I can tell you the image that comes to my mind, no guessing what it is or no surprises what it is, it's the image of family. Here's a bunch of ordinary people and they're sharing their homes, they're sharing their meals, they're sharing their possessions and they're caring for each other and they're looking after each other's needs. And on top of all of that, as Kenny said, they are celebrating their common faith in prayer and worship. Isn't that what any family does? Now, by family, I don't just mean a nuclear family. In the, in the New Testament, the word most often used for church is the word oikos. We've, we've come across this word before. It's a Greek word. It doesn't mean building. It means household. It means extended family. It means the big family. It means grandparents and grandchildren. It means mums and dads. It means brothers and sisters and cousins. It means uncles and aunts. It means everybody who is family. That is the word used in the New Testament to describe church. To be a member of the church in, in, that, in those early church days meant you're, you're part of an extended family. You shared in a common life together. So that's what the New Testament church was like. One of the blessings of family life is this idea that we're, we're all there for each other. Parents look after their children, and then the theory is that children in their turn look after their parents. That's what the New Testament church was like. We're told everyone was filled with awe. We're told the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Those are significant words. 
because what was truly remarkable about the New Testament church was there were no walls around it. In other words, it was a church without walls. There were no boundaries. You, you didn't need a ticket to get in. Remarkable because the culture of that time was, was made up of different, it was, everybody was different. Everybody was separated from each other. There were different sects who didn't speak to other sects. There are different tribes who didn't eat with other tribes. There are different languages who just kept themselves to themselves. Every, every, everything was compartmentalized. And, and those who, who were in those compartments looked after their own, but they didn't really care for anybody else. And yet here's a bunch of people who welcome everybody. They welcome whoever, whatever language you speak, you're welcome. They, you know, old, young, they're all welcomed. Um, uh, poor people are welcomed. Strangers are welcomed. Outcasts are welcomed. People from different tribes are welcomed. No wonder the church grew. I mean, this was remarkable. People wanted to find out what was going on here. The gospel message attracted people to Jesus. The life of the first church made his message real. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Saved from that other world into this new world that was being created. Something else to say about families is that they can be a bit messy. They can be a bit messy. Um, hands up if you belong to a perfect family. I'll just do a quick check. Is your family perfect? I, I can't see anybody rushing to put their hands up. You know what I mean? Family life can be a bit messy, but that's what makes them attractive, especially to people who are lonely and isolated. If you think about attractive, the word attractive, there are actually different ways to be attractive. There are those who think they're attractive because of the way they look. I'm attractive. And to them, attraction is on the outside. It's about being good looking, having great hair, being well turned out. Okay, so that's one way of thinking about being attractive. Another way of thinking about being attractive is it's what you do that makes you attractive. And so you can spend your life trying to be impressive or being in the right place at the right time or being important or being highly thought of because of what you do. That's what makes you attractive. But there's another way to be attractive or there's another way in which we can think of what it means to be attractive. There are, there are people who are attractive simply because of who they are. They're good-natured, they're loving, they're generous, they're kind, they're reliable. They're the sort of people you like being with. You find their company attractive. And you could apply those three different ways of being attractive to church as well. What makes a church attractive? Is it how it looks? Is it how beautiful its building is? Is it how excellent its worship is? Is it how... You know, everything is just sparkling. Is that what makes a church attractive? Or is it what a church does? Is it having a busy program, lots going on, great quality, well publicized, well communicated? I mean, all these things are important, don't get me wrong. <laughs> all these things make a difference. But I think what matters most is a church where the people are nice and open and friendly and welcoming, who are good to be with, who make church a good place to be. That's what makes it attractive. Here at Liberton, we talk about trying to make our margins matter. Our margins matter. What on earth do I mean by that? Well, I mean, if we have something going on, whether it's a service or a concert or an event or even a Kirk session meeting, we encourage people to turn up early and stay late. In other words, don't just turn up on the dot and leave on the bell. Use the margins, the bits beforehand, the bits afterwards, just to get to know with people a bit better, to find out how they are to enjoy each other's company.
I mean, that's something that's been quite difficult during COVID-19. I mean, usually the chatter before and after a service is, is just a big buzz and a big part of our church life. Of course, COVID-19, you can't do that. And yet the chatter on Zoom has been incredible as well. But, you know, things are getting better. And I'm really looking forward to the time, which is coming soon, when we will be able to go over there for coffee. We're actually allowed to have coffee after the services now. It's just we haven't got it organized yet. So if you'd like to help organize the coffee across, probably in the Anderson Hall after the service, please have a word with me, because these things do make a difference. These little things make church attractive. And all this is important. All this makes a difference. If you ask yourself, if, if church is a family, what sort of a family would you rather be part of? One where everyone's so busy, they never spend time together, or one which is so impressive, but nobody knows anybody else, or one which is a bit messy, but where people get on and pull their weight and look after each other. I think that's the kind of church we need to aim to be. Over the past few weeks, we've been exploring the things that research has shown make a church more attractive to people of all ages. And we've talked about sharing leadership, and we've talked about the need for greater empathy and understanding, you know, listening to each other better. We've talked about keeping Jesus and his message at the heart of everything we do. But today, our focus, as you probably guessed, is, is on our relationships with each other. Because research has shown that the best all-age churches are places where relationships can be described as warm. Warm. W-A-R-M. Warm. I'm told warm is the new cool, <laughs> if you follow me, which really puts me in a spin. I mean, I grew up in the 60s where everything was cool, man, you know. So now I'm saying, oh, that's warm. You know, it doesn't quite ring the same. It doesn't have the same ring to it. What a warm thing to, no, it doesn't really, does it work? Anyway, what do we mean by warm? Well, words like welcoming, words like accepting, words like belonging, words like authentic, no acting or role playing, words like hospitable, words like caring. That's what warm means. Warmth is not neat, and it's not compartmentalized, and it's not safe. Warmth is very messy. Listen to this quote. Warmth must be the DNA of the church family. Warmth helps young people find and stick with a church. Young people seek a messy warmth rather than neat and tidy, and they desire to share their messiness and walk alongside the real authentic messiness of others. How do we make sure Liberton Kirk is warm and messy? How do we make sure it feels like family? Here are, here are four, four quick pointers, okay? And they are quick, I hope. Firstly, we need to think about how we think about ourselves. We need to think about how we think about ourselves. I spoke a few weeks back of the danger of, in, in a bigger church, of, of a thinking being compartmentalized. You know, where we hear about something that's happening, it might be a quiz, it might be a, a, a coffee morning, it might be a concert, and we immediately compartmentalize, we put it in a compartment. We think, oh, that's for young people, or oh, that's for old people. And so, and really what we're working out is whether I'm going to go to it or not. You know, if it's for young people and I'm young, well, I'll go to it. If it's for young people and I'm old, well, then I won't. And, and so on, you know, you see, that's compartmentalized way of thinking. Often it's this sort of mindset which extends to the planning of the event itself. So we make assumptions about who the event's for when we're planning it. And then we, we go on about the fact, well, no young people have turned up or no old people have turned up, but it hasn't been planned for them. They haven't been part of the planning process. And I, you know, I've been thinking about it. That's something I'm as guilty of as anyone. So if we want our church to be a warm church, we need to think about how we think about ourselves. 
Second thing, when it comes to building relationships with people of a different generation, we need to always be ready to make the first move. Always be ready to make the first move. You know, older people are often intimidated by a group of young people. Young people need to know that and be ready to make the first move. But uh, the reverse also applies. Young people are often intimidated by a group of old people. And older people need to know that and be ready to make the first move. Always be prepared to make the first move. The third pointer, the first move might mean something as simple as learning someone's name. I can still remember a few years back when Andy Chittick spoke to our Kirk session. And he said, if by the time a young person leaves school, they are not known by name by at least five adults who are not directly related to them, five adults who are not part of their nuclear family, if you like, then they are unlikely to feel they belong and they're unlikely to stay. I remember um, Lucy, my daughter, telling me once how she was walking down Princess Street with her friends. We'd been here for a few years by then, and uh, she was a teenager walking down Princess Street, and people kept saying hello to her. <laughs> they said, hi, Lucy. Hi. And her friends go, who is that? Oh, they're from my church. Hi, Lucy. Who's that? Oh, they're from my church. <laughs> it really made a difference to Lucy that people knew her by name. How many of our young people do you know by name? How many of our older people do you know by name? And then the fourth thing, the fourth pointer. Use opportunities to spend time with people of a different age from yourself. Use opportunities. I've spoken of using margins. Margins matter. Another thing we can use is our, our, our skills and our gifts. Things that we can pass on. You know, the best way to get to know someone is to work on something with them. That's how you get to know them. That's why mentorship works so well. That's why apprenticeship works so well. Uh, people in an older generation have got a vast resource of skills they can pass on. Things that they just take for granted. They, things they just do, like their tax returns or, um, or how to bake a cake or, you know, how, how, to, how, to, how to plant bulbs. <laughs> There's so much that we, in a, who are older, can actually pass on to folks that are younger. And it's the time we spend doing that that really matters. Similarly, people who are younger can actually have, have, do already have a, a vast supply of skills that they can pass on to older people. How, how to make a film. How, how to work a mobile phone. I mean, I'm still trying to work out how to do that myself. Who do I ask? I ask someone who's younger than me. And it, again, it's the time you spend together. That's what makes the difference. It helps you know the people by name. It helps make that relationship and bonding stronger. So there's four pointers. Two final things to, to finish with. The first, for a church to feel like family really does matter. It really does make a difference. Remember the story of the prodigal son? I mean, it's just a story Jesus told, but it's one that so many people relate to. It was because he was desperate that the son came back, but it was because of the way he was welcomed that he stayed when he got there. It makes a difference. I, it's something I can relate to particularly because um, when I was in my early 20s, I experienced the warmth and welcome of the church in another country. I won't mention which one. Um, and I was, I was stunned by it. Why do they like me so much? I couldn't believe it. And it really sort of gave me a jolt and set me on a path which, which led me back to, to my own faith. Um, I remember hearing Brad. Hands up if you know Brad. Quite a few of you do. 
I remember him when he was giving his testimony, uh, actually here at evening worship once, um, and he was talking about how when he got involved with, um, with Young Life, particularly at the stage in Slam, people were nice to him. <laughs> particularly remember, um, he's talking about Claire Down, um, and she used to live just over there, being nice to him. He said, and he, is, he was so suspicious, what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> he, he wasn't used to people being nice to him, but it really made a difference. I mean, ask Brad. So for a church to feel like family really does matter. And the second thing I want to say, and this is the final thing, families are not perfect. We've already established that. And a church is not perfect. And you will never find a perfect church. I can guarantee you that. Because church is like family. Often people walk away from a church because they have discovered that it's not perfect. And if that's ever happened to you, then I'm sorry. But, you know, it's much harder to walk away from a place where you know that people love you. And if people love you and you know that people love you, it's so much easier to come back again. Shall we just spend a few moments in silence? And, and I'm gonna ask if, if, if anything has just jumped out at you from what you've heard today, you know, really struck a chord, um, it might be God giving you a nudge. And you need to spend some time just having a wee chat with him and asking, well, so what do you want me to do about it? Okay, so let's just do that in a few moments of silence right now, and then I'll say a prayer. Loving Father, we thank you for the privilege of knowing that we are your children and that you love us. Help us to love each other. In Jesus' name, amen.